you here with us this morning. We are so excited for what we get an opportunity to just be with you here today, an opportunity to encounter God. We've been praying for you. We've been believing for you. Man, can I tell you, we are excited to be starting a new series with you here this morning. Come on, everybody. The worship team is ready. We are ready. And we cannot wait for these next 10 weeks what God is going to be doing here in this place and in each of your homes. So get ready, everybody. Get ready because it's going to be exciting. We can't wait to reveal it to you in just a few minutes here. So as we start, I want to pray with you here this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you, the opportunity to love you and to be loved by you. So, Lord, we pray that for each and every person in their homes, Lord, that they would receive encouragement and love. Lord, that they would receive everything that the kingdom of God has to offer as they press in here this morning. Lord, may our praise and our worship honor you we love you, God, in your mighty name. Amen. Focused on your promise. Still I see the giant. In the midst of chaos, I will look through eyes of faith. Even when the wars rage, I know it's not my battle. Your spirit goes before me, so every enemy must bow. As you make mountains move, you pull strongholds down. None can stand against you. Kings lay down their crowns. Every fear is silenced. For you, word is true. When it seems there's no way, you make mountains move. Remembering your goodness, your power and provision. Weakness and in triumph, your faithfulness has carried me. With burning expectation, I stand in this assurance. The God of resurrection will be the one to overcome. You make mountain move, you pull strongholds down. None can stand against you, kings lay down their ground. Every fear is silent, for your word is true. When it seems there's no way, you make mountains move. You make mountains move. You make mountains move. You pull strongholds down. None can stand against you. Lay down the ground. Every fear is silent, for your word is true. When it seems there's no way, you make mountains move. You turn my doubt to dust. Come on. You fulfill your promises. Woo. Nothing's impossible. For my God will overcome. You turn my doubts to dust. You turn my doubts to dust. You fulfill your promises. You fulfill your promises. Nothing's impossible. Nothing's impossible. For my God. Yeah. For my God will overcome. You turn my
mountains move, you pull strongholds down. None can stand against you. Kings lay down their crowns. Every fear is silenced, for your word is true. When it seems there's no way, you make mountains move. Hearing that song, I think about all the different mountains that I've been feeling, mountains that are in front of me, that I'm like, God, how are these going to move? I know I need to, I need to get around this. I need to get past this. I need to get through this, but it seems so big. It's in my way. And what I love about this song is that it encourages us. It challenges us and asks us, who is king? Are we king? Do we need to lay down our crowns? Because if we're king, that mountain looks big. But if God is king here this morning, everybody, if God is king here this morning, he can make any mountain move for us. Amen. Amen. Can we pray that this morning? I don't know what your mountains are, but I'm sure you got some. Let's pray here as we continue on with our service. Heavenly Father, I pray for each and every single person that is watching here today. Lord, we pray that whatever the mountain is, whatever it is that is in their path, whatever it is that seems so big and difficult, Lord, I pray that you'd give us the humility, Lord, to lay down our crown and say, God, we can't move it. We can't do it. But Lord, we look to you, the true king here this morning. And we say, God, you have all power, all authority to be able to move that mountain because God, you are almighty. Lord, we pray that, we speak that blessing over our church, this blessing over each and every listener. Lord, give us the faith and the trust to know that you can move every single mountain here today. In your mighty name, amen. Come on, can I get an amen there? Man, if you are online there with us this morning, thank you. I want to welcome you for joining us here. We see your comments there in the chat. We see your amens. We see your hearts and your likes. We want to encourage you that we see all that, and we appreciate you being a part of this, this time here with us each and every Sunday. So thank you so much. We want to encourage you as well that we can have our, our weekly services, obviously, that we are doing here every single Sunday, so continue to be a part of that. We also have our Wednesday services, our upper room service, opportunity to pray together, opportunity to declare God's word together. So please join us for that Wednesdays, 7 o'clock. We've been doing that faithfully for a long time, y'all. We also continue to have our discipleship groups. So if you've been a part of a discipleship group, Come on, I know you're probably doing well and staying encouraged. If you're saying, you know what, I would love to be a part of that. I'd love to be able to meet up on, on a Zoom call and, and, and just be encouraged and talk to some people. Please know you can go online and find out the different times for that that we have. So continue to do that. Thank you for being a part of that. And we want to encourage you just to continue to stay connected and know that we, there's a whole lot of folks that love you here throughout the week. With that, we're going to roll a video, a bumper video, that is going to reveal to you what our summer series is, what we're going to be diving into here for the next 10 weeks or so. Let's go ahead and run that video.
All right. Well, welcome again to our service at Every Nation City Church. And we are starting our summer series every year. We love to do a summer series. Last year, we talked about the life of David, the man who would be king. This summer, we're talking about Joseph. Dreams, detours, and destiny. Come on. It's going to be awesome. This is something that we actually, as a staff, we thought about doing it last summer, uh, back at the beginning of 2019, and we waited, we postponed it. We really wanted to do David this uh, past summer, 2019, but this summer is a fulfillment of something that we have been thinking about, praying about for a year and a half. And in light of everything that our nation and the world is going through, this series has incredible importance and significance. And so as we begin, I've asked some of our next generation uh, pastors to come and to have a little discussion rather than start the message with me preaching and start the series with me preaching. We're going to have a little discussion here today about Joseph and its significance. And Ben, I'm going to start with you, if that's okay. I'm going to start right. on my right and work my way around. I'll start with, uh, I'll start with youngest and, well, he's the youngest over there, but we're going to let you start it anyways. <laughs> I'll but, take um, it, I'll take it. <laughs> you, you might look the youngest, but, uh, you know, what, why should we study the life of Joseph. I mean, why is this so important? Not just because of uh, this point in time in 2020, but just in general, as Christians, why should we do this? Yeah, I think the, the thing about the story of Joseph is unlike many other characters in the Old Testament, Joseph points to the character and the person of Jesus almost more than anyone else. Yeah. And the fact that he goes ahead of his people and becomes the savior that they so desperately need in a time when they so desperately need it, to me, points to so many things that are relevant to our own life mm -hmm. and our own walk with Jesus in mm -hmm. today's day and age. Yeah, that's wonderful. Wow. Josue, Hello, it's good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank just, you. I, I just, I love this man. He's such an incredible guy. Him and his wife and their, their two amazing sons are just so great. And he leads, he helps lead our in Espanol service that we've been doing for two years now. Yes. And uh, I know you're getting better at your English and you've been all I'm over trying. the world. You've <laughs> been a missionary. You've done missions work and ministry in Mexico. Yes. From your perspective, uh, I mean, you've studied the life of Joseph. Mm -hmm. Why should we Christians look at this life of Joseph and, and study it? Why should we take a whole summer for us to discuss yes. this? Because I know you'll be preaching about it in Espanol. Yes, amen. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been thinking about that. Uh, and uh, when, uh, that's remind me, when I was a kid, I used to dream a lot. Yes. I used to dream me <laughs> preaching, then singing, wow. then traveling the world. And right now, I'm all, I have other dreams. It's all right? happening. Uh, yes, come on. yes. That's amazing. When, when I saw that, the, the life of uh, Joseph, that's what I saw. A young man, a man that uh, uh, have a dream. And I think that's, that teaches a lot, a lot to us. That's amazing. <laughs> Wonderful. Jonathan, we're going to go to you. And I know, uh, just a little, no, I know, no, we're, we're looking at each other. We're not going to look at the camera, if that's okay. So, Jonathan, your thoughts on uh, why we need to study uh, the life of Joseph. You know, what I love about the story of Joseph, and it's so relatable for us, is that sometimes in Scripture you see people uh, make uh, dubious choices. <laughs> or some, some choices that we understand, okay, you know what, that probably led to them having some difficulty, <laughs> right? But in the life of Joseph, you know, you have a young man and, yeah. a, and a man that ultimately is upstanding, ultimately yeah. wants what God wants for the right. most part, right. and yet still faces these difficulties, faces these detours in his life where yeah. you're saying, gosh, why did God allow that? Or, yeah. or why did that happen? And, and I think that relates to many of us right. saying, you know, God, I, I don't know. Like, God, if there's sin in my life, show me. Like, but, but I'm not seeing anything, and yet why is this happening? And I just think it's very relatable. Yeah, very good. And that's a great point that, you know, with a lot of characters in the Old Testament, you see so much dysfunction. You see so much uh, sin and selfishness and self-absorption. Yet with Joseph, um, it, it can be argued, and we will be talking about this over the next nine weeks or so, that, that actually he did so much right. He didn't deserve any of this, yet it came on him anyways. And I think that's an encouragement for Christians that, man, even if you do things right, it doesn't mean that you're going to get to your destiny and you're, you're going to realize your dreams right away. It's going to take time, and uh, it might take some tears as well, right? Yeah. Uh, ben, uh, 
the significance? How do, how do you identify with someone like Joseph? Yeah, so, you know, when I was thinking about Joseph's life, there's so many things that we can identify with. And for me, the thing that really stands out is that he was a man who continued to walk faithfully, as Jonathan just said, day by day. And what also really stands out is that he had this dream, and in his dream, it seemed like it was getting further and further yeah. and further away from yeah. him. Yeah. And so he continued to walk, he continued to stay faithful. He seemingly had a good attitude in the way that he served both Potiphar and in the prison, and then eventually towards Pharaoh. And in spite of all of that, while his dream seemed to be going the opposite direction of his own life, he continued to stay faithful where he was. And you don't see any part of him that says, I gotta figure out how to make this happen for yeah. myself. Not and a lot of self-effort there. Not a lot of, yes, yeah, a lot of submission yeah. to God's plan and purposes unfolding in God's ways. I shouldn't say self-effort, not a lot of self-promotion. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so to me, I think I get in a place sometimes where if I don't see the things coming to pass in a way that I expect them to, yeah. Yeah. then I start to say, okay, well, what can I do to try to make this happen? Because it looks like I'm going the wrong way here, so how can I get back <laughs> on track? Right. But Joseph's story reminds Beautiful. me. Beautiful. You just let God continue to unfold his plan in his yeah. ways, and you can be all right. Yeah. Josue, we had an interesting, we've had a couple of dialogues in the last yes. few days. I mm -hmm. know that Joseph, you can relate to Joseph for, mm -hmm. for several major reasons. Give us one of those we were talking about just beforehand. Yes, sure, Pastor. Well, for me, Joseph, it's very, very uh, important, and I, uh, because uh, the life of Joseph passed different process, right? Yeah. And uh, since uh, he was a young and he had this dream, big dream, uh, sometimes when, when I was a young, there, there was a, a, a time that I came, uh, somebody came and told me the word of God and told me, you're going to do, be doing this and that. So my heart grow and say, wow, it's going to be awesome and yeah. everything. But then the, start, <laughs> the life start yeah. and really does not happen like that yeah. I, was, I was thinking before. But then comes uh, what uh, we call the detours. The detours, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's amazing how uh, this happened, but really God is in control. You've had a lot of detours. Mm -hmm. You know, you, it's for you to get out here to L.A. Yes. <laughs> take me through, just, to, just take everybody a little bit through. You, did you start in Mexico? Well, yes, I, I, I was born in Juarez, and yes, then I moved Juarez. to Mexico, to then Zacatecas, Mexico. Zacatecas. Then I come uh, to U.S. to live in Houston, Texas. Houston. Then I live in Midland, Texas. <laughs> yes. Then I moved to Colorado. Yes. And then I moved back to Texas, and then I ended up here. That's right a lot, <laughs> lot of detours, a lot of left and right turns. No straight line there, That's right? That's right. That's but, right. But um, God's been faithful through it all, right? Yes. In all that, that process, I've been thinking sometimes I'm, I'm getting uh, out of track. Yeah. But then I realize yeah. God is showing me something yes. in that track yeah. that I'm taking. Very so. good. Jonathan, your, your take on just how you identify with, with someone like Joseph. I have been in every nation. I've been a Christian for a long time. <laughs> and I've had a lot of great quality people that, and either prophetically or, or just as I've been opening up scripture since I was a young kid, begin just to hear and, and process the destiny that God's personally given me and things that, that um, I get passionate about and things that I believe God has set apart for me to accomplish. And some of that's been spoken over me, and some of that's been things that I've just gleaned as my personal time with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think that as we're talking about dreams, detours, and, of course, destiny, yeah. I believe, I truly believe that every single Christian has a destiny mm -hmm. that's God-given. Yes. A destiny that, 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 that is unique. Yes. And they have a part to play. And, and I've believed that for a long time, and thanks to my parents is, is part of that yeah. process of growing me to believe yeah. that. We pray it every that. night. Over, every night we sit down next to your bed and we say, you're going to change the world. Well, and you we used pray. to. Now, now I've got my own place. No, not anymore. Yeah, not in my bed anymore. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. No. No, thankfully, he, you know. He does come and raid my fridge. He I does, do. He lives close enough to do that, but I, no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, just that, that, that destiny is something that I think is so important for every Christian it, or, or those that are listening to say, you know what, that, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I want to know what that is more. Yeah. But then for those that are Christians saying, yeah, you know what, I've, I've, I've heard that, but I've been waiting a long time. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I heard that a long time ago. <laughs> God said yeah. something. Yeah. How long does this take? Yeah. We can get weary, can't we? Absolutely. Yeah. Ben, I think you wanted to add something to that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's so good that you, we talk about this idea of destiny. And the other thing that I love about Joseph's story is at the very beginning, you see a little bit of a, an arrogance that he kind of displays towards his brothers about how he's got this great dream and destiny that God's given him over yeah. them. And what I love is you see the maturation process yes. in his life. From to the 17 end, From 17 all forward. the way up to yeah. about 37. We yes. talked about about 20 yes. years. Yes. And at that point, at the end, when he's actually faced with his brothers face to face again, yeah. his destiny now seems to be less about him and more about God's plan. Yes. God's ultimate plan to bring Beautiful. redemption to his God's people, yeah. which he first gave as a promise to Abraham, his grandfather. Right. And so to me, it was great grandfather. Yeah. And so to me, it's a great reminder to us that our destiny is not all about us, but mm. God wants us to actually align ourselves to what mm -hmm. his purpose is and his ultimate destiny is. And yeah. as we do that, then it really begins to unfold. Yeah. I'm going to go back this way. Last question. And, I want, and then we'll end with you, Ben, is, and this wasn't scripted, so you're gonna, I'm going to put you on the spot here. So... <laughs> Of all of the character traits of Joseph, from resiliency to keeping hope in the middle of a pit in a dungeon to uh, living pure and fleeing temptation, you know, I could go on and on, but uh, what do you admire that you'd like to share with us here about just the character quality, you know, that was riveted into Joseph's life at an early age? As far as something that I just admire, I, I really have admired his, his purity, yeah. his stand for purity. It was one of the yeah. things that even as a young kid inspired me being raised in the church. Again, that's something that's not really valued in culture as much these days, right? Yeah. And here to see that he fought. Mm -hmm. He fought the, the, the giants that have to be faced by young men and young women to, to hold on to that purity. And that, you know what? I think that there was part of the reason that I think that there was such clarity for him to be able to hear and receive from God as clear as he did, it was because he clung to that. And it's always mm. inspired me from my youth even mm. to this day that, that that fight has worth and value that will carry you forward. Yeah, wonderful. Josue, what, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, yes. he overcame disillusionment. The, there was pains, there was tests, there were problems, and he, mm -hmm. he pushed through them all. Mm -hmm. He didn't try to circumvent them. He had to go through them. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about just his family and some of the pains from his own family. And what, what do you admire well, from Joseph's I, life? I admire that he never gave up. He never gave up. Uh, oh. Because uh, it wasn't easy for him. I yeah. mean, since uh, he was a, a, a child, and I didn't identify with him because he was the youngest uh, of his family, and, and me too, in my case. Uh, but uh, after the dream and after the, the hate of the brothers, and they, they got to, 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 uh, to, the, to this part, to the jail, they, he was selling this, uh, and passes all the process. Yeah. He never gave up. And mm -hmm. then he saw uh, the grace of God that opened the door. Whenever mm. he put, uh, I mean, he was with Potiphar, he was with, uh, in jail, he was right. in every place. Yeah. God put him in, in, in somehow. Beautiful. He didn't, he didn't give up. Yes. Kept on hanging yes. in there. Ben, you get the last word last before, word. We, uh, before, before we move into the... Before you get the last word, yeah. Well, <laughs> no, no I get the next word. You get the last word here. Um, <laughs> See, when you get, when you get yeah. four preachers on stage, oh, yeah. everybody always wants the, the, the last, last word. word. I'm, I'm referring to you. <laughs> thank you, so. thank you. I appreciate right. it. Uh, the thing that I admire most about Joseph is his humility. Yeah. And uh, I just kind of referenced it how in the beginning you don't see necessarily a humble young man, but you see through the process of life and all the experiences that God mm -hmm. took him through that it actually worked in him a greater sense of humility to trust God and to see his life in light of what God was doing above him. And I, I just love it. I know Pastor Jim talks about this a lot. But it almost was this process of him getting into a place where he could be trusted with the position that God wanted to put him in. Mm -hmm. And in order to get there, though, there had to be a humility mm -hmm. so that he knew that it really was God's hand and God's hand alone that put him in that position, mm -hmm. as opposed to his own ability, yes. his own strength, and his own Beautiful. natural talents. Excellent. And I, I'm going to say, I do get the last word. I defer to you, but I've just decided. <laughs> I told you. I've just decided <laughs> that I'm going to do it. To I know me, you will. I know you will. To me, Joseph is an amazing example of being able to work his way out of dysfunction, 
the dysfunction of his family was crazy, crazy. And yet uh, he didn't have good modeling in, in his life. He didn't, he didn't have a good formation in his early years. Even his mom and dad, there was a lot of stuff going on there. Yet he was able to, uh, by the grace of God, by humility, by everything we said, purity, he was able to extricate himself from his family dysfunction in a way where he could affect and influence his culture. So Amen. looking forward to this uh, series, this, and every single one of you are going to be sharing uh, throughout the series, as well as uh, our uh, Pastor Jim, who is about ready to take up the offering. Pastor Jim. All right. So exciting time this summer. Amen. You know, every week we try to take you on a wild ride through history with an exciting character and someone of usually the Christian faith, which we are able to emulate and copy. But, you know, we had something happen in our own history just in the last five weeks. And we wanted to take, I wanted to take this week to really drill down in something that most of the people in the church have been a part of. And a lot of times uh, our average church member doesn't really get to see or understand exactly what goes on. And we've had some exciting things happen over this time. And so, uh, you know, we've had two big food giveaways. In fact, a few weeks ago, Pastor Brett Fuller, he was in our church and it was, it was a moving and inspiring message. But one of the points, if you go back and you listen to his message, one of the things he was most proud of with Every Nation City Church was the fact that we were willing to reach away from ourselves and to serve our community, even in a difficult and a challenging time. You know, over the course of 10 or 12 weeks and in this uh, quarantine and uh, the limited ability to see one another, it, it, you can wrestle, uh, you, we can uh, be fatigued, we can kind of get in a rut. And we've always having to work ourselves spiritually to sort of see the hope in God's plan, the endurance that God presses into us to strengthen us. And, you know, we've had two amazing moments in that where the whole church put their effort, their faith, their energy into and did something quite extra and uh, ordin uh, unordinary. You know, about five weeks ago, we served about 160 families. This past Sunday, we served just about another 160 families. We, uh, we uh, received over 9,000 pounds of food from not only the Valley Food Bank, from about, also about a hundred of our church members that either brought food into the church or gave of their finances toward uh, adding to our food. I mean, uh, we are one of the most favored uh, pantry designations in the San Fernando Valley. And that is no light thing. That is no small thing. We have great favor with these people in the San Fernando Valley. And we were able to take that 9,000 pounds and over the course of five weeks, and our two distributions, we were able to supply 320 families with food. We were able to touch 150 new contact members that were able now to talk to via email and text message. And we were able to gather their information. One of the great stories from this last weekend was right towards the end of our event. And a couple uh, had to use our restroom facility there in the back auditorium. And as they got out of the car, we began to pray for each one of the couple. And they had been going to a church, and they had been struggling in that church. And there was about a 20-year age gap in their, in their relationship. They were about to get married. And they said, Pastor, all we could handle, uh, all, all the ministry that we're getting was people trying to convince us that it wasn't God, that we were 20 years apart trying to get married. Other than teaching us, we were desperate to know Jesus. We were desperate to know the fullness of his gospel. You know, it's amazing how in that one moment we were able to touch someone who probably wouldn't have normally come our way. But because of the food giveaway and the food drive and coming off the street, we were able to pray. Every single person that came this past Sunday was able to connect and touch and pray with our members. We were able to give them a, a CD and literature, the Gospel of John. We were able to touch them both in their physical aspect of giving them food, but in the spiritual aspect of, of introducing them to the gospel and to our church. You know, I put a little, uh, uh, I put a little uh, sort of thumb sketch of some of the things that happened, as I said, 
Uh, 9,000 uh, pounds of food, 320 families served, 150 people now connected to our church. 60 of uh, the people in our church volunteered for this event, and over 100 of you so lovingly and generously donated to the efforts. This was something that happened not in another century. It happened today. It's going to continue to happen with the grace and the favor of God that he's given us. And we're so thankful to each and every one of you. We thought we'd take this one moment to publicly as a leadership, thank you, thank you, thank you, church, for sticking in there, for fighting the good fight, for overcoming fatigue, for finding within yourself to give away from yourself and the amount of people you're touching. You have no idea. God bless you today. As you continue to give, as we enter this time of worship with the Lord, as we give of our substance as he has given us, we generally sow it back to his kingdom so that we can do more things like this and touch this desperately needing valley for the cause of Christ. Again, we thank you so much for, the, here, uh, for those that give through our push pay application, for those that go on to our website and give through our secure website, for those that faithfully continue week after week, send your checks in, Every bit of that is able to not only sustain the movements of this church, but to do the things like we got to see there in those pictures and those collages and continue to move and to press on. We're one of the only churches that are facilitating uh, other churches and we'll be even doing more so later in the summer to even, even uh, film them, be able them to have an online service. We're doing a great service for other churches in this valley, which God has positioned us perfectly for. God bless you today as you give so generously. And we thank you. Get your seat belts on. Get ready for an amazing word from our own Pastor Dave as we kick off this summer series of the life of Joseph. God bless you. In Jesus' name. All right. Well, I want to repeat and echo what Pastor Jim is saying. We want to thank you so much for not just giving of your finances, but your time, your energy, getting, participating, getting in a small group, uh, just really praying for this church, praying for your neighbor in your small group, and praying for your brother and sister here in the church. Thank you so much, church, for, I know it's, it's been a long three months of not being able to see each other in person, and I just want to say thank you so much for continuing to support, continuing to participate in this church. And thank you so much for your giving. Well, as promised, we are going to begin with an abbreviated uh, message. We took about 12 minutes to set the stage for Joseph. And I just want to give a prologue. So today, if you're wondering what we're talking about, I just want to give a prologue to Joseph's story. Okay? And uh, as we begin... Uh, I want to let you know that there's a prequel to Joseph's story. Okay, if, to understand Joseph, you have to go back and you have to understand the prequel. You know, have you ever seen a movie where they put out the first movie or they write the first book, then they go, wait a second, we're going to have to stop and do a backstory, what's called a prequel, so that way people understand more what happened. Now, let me give you a few movie uh, prequels. Oz the Great and Powerful is a prequel to The Wizard of Oz. It was done like 45, 50 years later, uh, maybe longer. Rogue One is the prequel to the Star Wars original trilogy, okay? Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, I didn't even know this, was a prequel to the Raiders of the Lost Ark. I didn't know it because I did not like that movie, The, the Temple of Doom. It was too scary for me. So I, I just kind of breezed through that real quick. But that was a prequel to the Raiders of the Lost Ark. And the Hobbit series, I didn't know that, this is a prequel to the Lord of the Rings. So I want you to do me a favor. On your chat section, if you, if you just humor me, and I'd like you to right now in the chat section uh, on Facebook or even if you can on YouTube, is just, just jot in there your favorite prequel. What is your favorite prequel? So go ahead and do that. And uh, my son and Ben are here, and they're going to kind of let me know throughout the time what your favorite prequel is. We will add it up, and we will find out just what our church watches <laughs> and what our church gets excited about. Okay, but um, 
prequels are really unique because they are usually done after an epic story to give the backstory. A prequel, the definition is a story or movie contain events that precede those of the existing epic work, okay? They help to fill in the unknowns. So the background, so that you get more background, so that you get the full meaning, okay? If we're going to understand the significance of Joseph's life, we have to go back before Joseph to his mom and dad, which is Jacob and Rachel, okay? I'll say it again. The only way to understand Joseph is you've got to get to know Jacob. It's just like one of the best ways to understand one of my five kids, Jonathan or Christian or Kara, Luke or Abigail, is you really have to meet Amy or I to understand the fullness of what is in my children. And so I want to go back to Genesis chapter 28. We have the scripture on our PowerPoint, but if you would, I'd like you to open up your Bibles to Genesis 28. I am reading from the English Standard Version. So we're going to try to understand Joseph a little bit more by looking at Jacob's life, okay? And Jacob is in his 70s here in this passage of Scripture in Genesis 28. Jacob left Beersheba. By the way, uh, that means seven springs of water, and went towards Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. And taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Verse 16, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he goes on and says, how awesome is this place. So you see Jacob, the father of Joseph, being a dreamer. And Jacob actually had several dreams. And one time, God even came to him in the middle of his dreaming and wrestled with him all night. Very, very interesting person, this Jacob. I want to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you some different questions just to make sure that we're dialoguing here. Have you ever had a dream that was so amazing and so wonderful and so glorious and full of promise and hope and meaning that you woke up and you thought, Man, wouldn't that be great if that happened, okay? Now, I know some of you have had nightmares. I've had some, I, over the years, have bad dreams, but I also have these good dreams. You know, the worst thing is when you have a really good dream, but you wake up and you can't remember what it was. But I will tell you, one dream that I've had several times is this. This is kind of funny. I graduated college, and even, even after graduating college, I would have this dream that recurred where I was finishing the term, and at the very last week when finals were starting, I realized that I had a class that was part of my class schedule that I never went to the whole term. And then I literally walked into the class for the finals, and I said, look, I'm not ready for this. I'd go up to the teacher or the TA and say, I'm not ready for this test. And the teacher said, I'll just take it anyways, and, you know, we'll see if you do. And I, and I had this amazing dream that I took the test, and I got like a B or an A without ever listening to the lectures, without ever, you know, taking notes, without ever reading any of the books. And, uh, wow, what a wonderful dream that was. And then I woke up, okay, <laughs> and I realized, wow, that's just not going to happen. I know that there's a lot of students, maybe some listeners, today would be like, that would be glorious if I didn't have to go. Maybe there's a few of you students here that are listening that you've tried that. I got to tell you, it does not work. But it is a wonderful, wonderful dream. And I'm sure that every one of us have had these kinds of dreams that maybe there's a little bit of truth to it and it takes reality, but then it takes something and it brings a deeper significance to that. And uh, there was a significance to those dreams that I'll get into in the weeks ahead. But here in this passage, getting back to the story, in Genesis 28, God is giving Jacob 
the exact same promise that he gave to his grandfather, his great-grandfather, I'm sorry, his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac. Jacob now has his own, if you will, meeting, his own experience with God, and God comes to him and gives him a divine dream. And there's about six things that are key that God says to Jacob in the middle of this dream. One, I will give you this land. Two, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. Three, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Four, I will watch over you wherever you go. Five, I will bring you back to the land. And six, I will always be with you. Wow, that is amazing. So Jacob, as the father of Joseph, he has several dreams. And in this dream, the context is he's on the run. He is fleeing for his life. He's just deceived his brother Esau. He's headed out of the area of Canaan up to about like three, four hundred miles away to Haran to go visit some uh, relatives, okay, and to hopefully find a wife for himself, okay? And he has this dream of God and angels going up and down on this ladder. Then God tells him that the very place where he's sleeping and dreaming, this place is going to be his, and he's going to inherit it and his descendants after him. What an amazing promise. I'm sure for years this dream stuck like riveted, like a hot rivet inside of Jacob's mind, but it never seemed to materialize. I just want to ask you, have you ever been in this same situation as Jacob, where you have this dream. It's amazing. It's wonderful. It's life-giving. It has it full, chock full of destiny and purpose, but then it doesn't seem to materialize. What's even worse is that you plot on, you think you're getting closer, and then like a mirage on the horizon, it just vaporizes. How do you feel when you have a dream or when there's a certain vision that God, you know God's given it to you for your life, and then you find yourself feeling that you're going in the opposite direction? Well, I'll answer that question. It's discouraging. It can make you feel empty. Let me give an example. I know that this seems like a very long ago idea, but a lot of us had dreams and plans and a sense of destiny at the beginning of 2020. Did we not? And we were all thinking, wow, this is a new decade. I mean, this is a new season. And we're like, it's going to be great. It's going to be better than ever. And then March hits here in the United States. Now, in other nations, it was more like in November, December, January, where COVID struck. And it seems that a lot of dreams just got shattered, or at least they vaporized like a mirage. You get closer, you plot, and then it just, it's gone. It evaporates. And we all have experienced this. And then you think about all of the, the racial injustice, the unrest that we've been through in the last few weeks. And it can seem like a lot of people that we're moving in the opposite direction of our dreams. But look at how Jacob responds to this dream. It's the last verse. It says, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said, surely, and we have this on the PowerPoint, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Would you say that with me out loud, what uh, Jacob said? Let's say it out loud for us nine or ten in the room. Ready? Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Okay. Jacob wasn't aware of what God was doing. He knew about God from his granddad and from his dad. He knew about God because he had learned in Bible school some prayers and some different things. And, but he wasn't quite aware of the presence of God. Here he is on the run. He's, fried, he's fleeing for his life. He's afraid that everything that he's wanted in life is going to be literally snuffed out by a very angry brother. And he's not aware in the middle of all of his pain, in the middle of all of his angst and his anxiety and his fears, he is not aware that God is there, okay? Now, it's interesting. John Piper quotes on this, and he says, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life that you may not be aware of. Now, we have it right there for you to look at. God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you may not be aware of three of them, <laughs> Isn't that the case for so many Christians? The truth is that I want to speak for a moment to, in the, the, the heart and the soul of every person that is participating today online. God is doing thousands of things in your life. You might only be aware of two or three of them, 
But I want you to know something. If you've invited Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, if you've invited God into your life, he's doing so many things on so many different levels from your character to your relationships to friendships to understanding the Bible to learning how to be sensitized more to his presence to developing your prayer life. There's, there's so many things that God is doing at the same time concurrently in your life and most of it you're not aware of. And here's the thing I want to encourage you with. You might, I, I, don't feel bad if you're not aware of it all, but here's what I want to encourage you to do is I want you to keep on keeping on even when you feel like you're fleeing for your life or when your life is going in the wrong direction. You might not know what God is doing, but you need to keep dreaming, even if you think you're going in the opposite directions. Your divine dreams that God has given you will come true. Just like Jacob found the wife of his dreams, who gave him the son of his dreams, God is going to fulfill the deepest dreams that he's given to you. We all need to dream. God gives us dreams so that we can have a living hope. See, we're going to face trials. We're going to face challenges. And they will make us better if we can keep on dreaming. We overcome discouragement and depression more easily by continuing to dream. You know, the moment we really begin to die is the moment where we stop dreaming. Okay. Dreams inspire us to develop new and better habits. Dreams are wonderful things. C.S. Lewis said this, you're never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. I love that. Say that with me. You're never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. Now, Amy and I were doing some research about dreaming, and some of the top uh, specialists in the area of dreaming have this to say, and I'm just going to read this from this page. It's really interesting. Dreams can be crucial to our emotional and mental health and can be a means by which we solve problems and deal with emotions and thoughts. It is thought that, uh, that dreams play an important role in providing us with the ability to function psychologically. Dreams can give clues to areas of our lives which require attention, our significant relationships or aspects of ourselves which we are concerned about. The importance of dreams should not be underestimated, nor should we dismiss reoccurring themes. These are some of the leading uh, uh, counselors and psychologists of the day say, telling us how important dreams are. And I love it. Uh, I, I have a little monitor on my watch that tells me how my sleep is going. And normally I get about an hour of deep sleep. And I guess they say that, and I'm not sure about this, I'm no expert, but they say that you, you're not going to remember many dreams from your deep sleep. But as you go out of deep sleep into, as you start coming back up out of sleep, you begin to have these dreams. And it's then kind of in that never, never land where God can, can, take a hold of your dream cycle and begin to speak things to you. And I want to encourage you to do something for me. If you don't do this, Amy and I have been doing this for years, and that is journaling. Now, I journal mostly off of Scripture. I journal mostly on what I see in the Word of God. But I don't want to discount, even people that aren't Christian necessarily, but they're professionals say, don't discount, don't underestimate the value of dreams. Okay, now, but at a, let me go a little deeper about dreams. There is something even more important about dreams that we can learn from, from, from Jacob. Until Jacob met the woman of his dreams in Rachel and the son of his dreams in Joseph, he didn't see the fulfillment of dreams. It's interesting that the fulfillment of dreams and being in a family are inextricably bound. I'll say it and we have it on the PowerPoint. The fulfillment of dreams and being in spiritual family or a loving family are inextricably bound together. Dreams are birthed in life, but they're realized and they become reality, come to fruition when we find our family. Pastor Jim LaFoon, one of our leaders of our every nation, uh, North America world, he says, when you find your people, you find your purpose. I'll say it this way. When you find family, you find destiny, okay? When God, he, first of all, he gives you himself, then he gives you close friendships or spiritual family, and then that is the foundation that can support the weight of the dreams. Let me say it another way, because there's so many people that flock to L.A. to realize their dream, but they never allow God to bring them into relationship with himself and with other Christians, and their dream quickly turns into a nightmare. The only way for a God-given dream to not just be fulfilled, but to be something that will not kill you and crush you 
and will not cause you to self-destruct is for you to be inextricably bound to loving brothers and sisters in Christ who will support you, who will pray for you, who might have to correct you when you get off track, who maybe, maybe you're too self-absorbed and your, your dream is centered around yourself and they have to constantly correct you and make sure that they put the salt and pepper shakers in the middle of the table and say, look, it's not about you. It's about Christ. It's about His dream. It's about His desire and how you fit into the bigger picture, how you fit into that meta-narrative story. So back to the story of Jacob here. So Jacob, for 20 years, that's a significant number. We're going to come back to that uh, uh, next week and the following weeks. For 20 years, Jacob has left his mom. He's left his dad. He is now in Haran, a foreign land, three, 400 miles away. And he waits for this dream to come to fulfillment. He works, he wanders, and he waits. And then, uh, then he marries Rachel, and they have the promised son of their dreams in Joseph. And we have this scripture for you in Genesis chapter 30, verses 22 through 24. It says, Then God remembered Rachel, this was, uh, this was Jacob's wife, and God listened to her and opened her womb, and she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. So the word Joseph means, May God add. Okay? So, Rachel, back in those days, is very different than today. This was 4,000, almost 4,000 years ago. And to have a son from your own womb was everything. It was like having a future, an inheritance, an insurance policy, and uh, a business all rolled into one in having a son. It was everything. So women, that was one of their amazing, amazing desires, was to have a son who would carry on the family legacy, who would carry the weight of responsibility in the home, who would really take care of parents when they got old. It was so important. So but, uh, and so here, Rachel, she feels this reproach because she doesn't have a son, and her, she's barren. And then in a moment in time, God opens up her womb. And I want to speak to every person here today. Maybe you feel barren. Maybe you feel like that you're not able to bear fruit for God. Well, I want to encourage you, if you keep seeking after God, if you keep searching for Him, if you keep plugged into God and stay abiding in Christ, that God will open up your womb, so to speak, and will cause you to give birth to an amazing dream. But back to the story, the name Joseph means, may the Lord add. Joseph added so much uh, uh, to Rachel's life and to really the entire family. Even Isaac and Rebekah benefited from Joseph. So Joseph, really, he lived out his name, may God add. But I want to go a little bit further, and this is God's heart for all of his children, that God wants to add to you. God doesn't want to take away from you. God wants to add to you. God wants every follower of Christ, he wants to add to them. He wants to add faith and hope and love to you. He wants to add family and friends and, and meaningful relationships to you and meaning and purpose to you. He wants to add favor and safekeeping and peace to you. God wants to add so much to you. Don't believe the lie. That the devil says that God's trying to take away from you. He's trying to rip things away from you. That's the absolute opposite of what really happens. That when we begin to follow Christ, when we become children of God, God wants to add so much of his kingdom, so much of his heart to you and to me today. So Joseph is this long-awaited son of Rachel and Jacob. Now Jacob loved Rachel more than any other woman. And this was the first child of Rachel. So the amount of time and energy and care and fathering and correcting and discipline that Joseph received was substantially more than the other brothers. Jacob and Rachel knew that this child was going to be special and going to influence the world. And so they put a lot of energy. They put a lot of uh, effort and uh, stock, if you will, into him. So there's this deep sense of destiny that Joseph inherited from Jacob. And there was the dreaming that, he got, that Joseph inherited from Jacob. But then there's the sense of destiny as well that Joseph inherited from Jacob. And that destiny de gene ran real deep in the life of Joseph. And God wants every single one of us. This is where I want to speak again to you today. God wants you, every single follower of Christ, to have a deep sense of destiny and purpose. 
I know you're thinking, Pastor Dave, you don't understand. You know, I, I'm, just, I'm just working, you know, as, I don't know, you know, I'm just pushing numbers on a computer. I, 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 how do I have a destiny and purpose? Listen, if you're a child of God, God has a great purpose for you. It goes far beyond your job. It goes far beyond your career. It has so much to do with God's kingdom being uh, given to you, being advanced through you, for you to be able to reach and to touch and to influence the lives of others. There's so much. There's God wanting you to experience the love and joy and peace of his kingdom. There's so much destiny and purpose that God has for each and every one of his children. Last thing I want to say before we end today is this, is that the life, and, and Ben alluded to this, the life of Joseph parallels the life of Jesus. As a matter of fact, most Christian theologians, and even I was even looking at some Hebrew and Jewish theologians, they believe that there's no other character in the Old Testament that their life parallels the life of Christ more than Joseph. No other Old Testament character foreshadows the life of Jesus better than Joseph. Okay, let me, this is, the list is astounding. Let me give you a few. And I'm going to send out an email this week with an attachment um, from Jews for Jesus on how the life of Joseph parallels the life of Jesus. But here's a few similarities that should cause you to marvel at God's destiny and plan and purpose. Both are the object of their father's special love. Both had promises of divine exaltation. Both were mocked by their family. Both were sold for pieces of silver. Both were stripped of their robe. Both were delivered to the Gentiles. Both were falsely accused. Both were faithful amid temptation. Both were thrown into prison. Both were numbered with transgressors. Both went before rulers. Both um, foretold the future accurately. Uh, their power was acknowledged by those in authority. They saved the rebellious brothers from death uh, when they realized who he really was. Both were exalted after and through humiliation. Both embraced God's purpose, even though it, br it brought them intense physical harm. Both are the instrument God uses as, at the hands of the Gentiles to bless his people. Both welcome Gentiles to be a part of the family. Both uh, give hungry people food. And with both of them, people must bow their knee before them both. So Joseph parallels the life of Jesus. But I want to say something else. Joseph's story is our story. You have divine dreams. I have divine dreams. We have people in our lives sometimes who make our dream difficult, who might even come along and they think they're helping us, but they're not. And it can be discouraging. It can be debilitating. But I want to encourage you today that if you can learn to study the life of Joseph, if you can learn to acquire the kind of character and the kind of just dig down deep and be able to gut it out like Joseph did, that there is a beautiful destiny and purpose that's waiting for you. So we're all part of God's plan for saving and delivering nations from sin and destruction. There's no better time than now for a Joseph generation. I just want to prophetically declare right now over this church and over Christian churches all around the world that in the middle of crises, there is a Joseph generation that is rising up to meet the need, to meet the famine. There is a famine of love. There is a famine of justice. There is a lack and a famine and a crisis of brotherly love in this world. And God is raising up a church. God is raising up a people that will model in a functional, healthy way what it means to love. What it means to care for others is even more important than themselves. The church is the answer more now than ever for all the crises and the famine that is going on in our nation and the nations of the world. So today, if you would just pray with me, I want you to look at the life of Joseph for the next nine weeks and I want you to look ahead to how it parallels Christ, but I want you to look even forward to how we, in a sense, as the body of Christ, parallel the life of Joseph as well. God's got his hand on you and me like he has his hand on Joseph. And he wants to use you and I to bring hope and deliverance to a dark world. I know that you're a dreamer. I'm a dreamer. God has sown such a deep sense of purpose into your heart. You have a heavenly destiny here on earth. 
Don't give up on your dreams. Don't back away from that divine destiny. I want you to say yes right now. In this moment, I want you to say yes to God's great plan, to his dream for your life, to God's destiny for your life. And I want you to say yes to the detours that are going to come your way. Let's pray. God, we say yes to your plan. God, would you take us away from being egocentric where everything revolves around us and cause us to mature and grow to where we see in reality that everything revolves around you. God, would you cause us right now, even though we might be in the middle of difficulties, roadblocks, hindrances, setbacks, detours, would you cause us to dream again? And would you cause us to know you have a great destiny for our lives? In Jesus' name, and all God people said, amen. Now, I'm going to ask you to worship with me. Please don't leave. We have structured this worship set as a response to everything we've just talked about. So would you worship with me for just a few minutes as we end? God bless you. You unravel me with the melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Oh, Jesus. From my mother's womb. You have chosen me, love has called my name, I've been born again into your family, your blood flows through my veins, I'm no longer child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Oh, oh, oh. 
how you talk with me Oh, how you walk with me How you tell me That I am your own Now I'm confident destiny. Church, I am excited to journey with you through the story of Joseph and expectant for what God is going to do in us as we take these next weeks, what the conclusion of our journey will look like, how this series will empower us and the journey that God has for each and every single one of you. I am so excited. Thank you for being here at the start and I will see you at the finish. Let's do this together, fam. I am excited. Thank you for being here with us this morning. We'll see you next week.
Defeat me.